Welcome everybody to episode 11 of the Back Lounge podcast. My name is Tank, I'm your host, and I'm a roadie with over 15 years of experience in the touring music industry. And if this is your first time watching or listening to the podcast, what we do here is invite band members, artists, other roadies, and anybody else in the music industry, and we just have conversations about whatever comes up, really. I aim for this to be less of an actual interview where you hear the same stereotypical questions with bands and stuff and more of an open conversation. I don't prepare for these. I just come in with whatever is already in my head that I know about our guest and we just go from there. And oftentimes it turns into really cool conversations. And this one was no different. And this one is actually kind of the first of its kind because this is the first guest I've had that is actually very well known from YouTube as well. And I'm talking about Elizabeth from The Charismatic Voice. And I know her and her husband, Kirk, pretty well. To be fair, I know her husband way more than I know her. And this was one of the first times I actually got to sit down and talk to her for this long, like uninterrupted. And I always knew she had a big background in music, more specifically vocal performance and studies and stuff like that. But I didn't know how extensive it was. Some of the stuff that she brought up in this kind of blew me away, man. She's a super traveled, super cultured person, super into the science of vocals, which is, you know, really cool because I've never really thought about it before until I started seeing channels like hers and then talking to her for this podcast episode. Now, this specific episode was filmed in early May of 2022, and for anybody that's familiar with Elizabeth's channel or follows along, you probably know that she was pregnant around this time. And since, you know, at the time this video is coming out, it's already happened, but she has given birth to her first child. So it was kind of cool on this one to talk to her before all of that happened, and it'll be kind of a trip to like go back and see this again, but this was just... So cool, man. And not only did we talk about her and her background, but we got into some YouTube related stuff and we were very honest and open and she made me think about things differently. And I'm just really excited to bring this one to you guys, man. But before we get started, got to give a shout out to this episode sponsor back again, Gothic Jewelry. Gothic Jewelry is an online retailer of fashionable and very affordable jewelry, man. And for those of you that follow my YouTube channel along and watch my videos, you've probably seen me wearing it all the time. And it's not just videos. I wear this stuff in my everyday life. I mean, right now, if you're watching this podcast on YouTube, you can see I'm wearing my normal rings and I have other stuff laying around that I change out all the time, depending on my mood and stuff like that. But I love their products. And one of the reasons I love them so much is because it was founded by a group of people that understood that jewelry is a good expression of yourself and your individuality, but they were tired of how expensive other jewelry companies were. And I'm the same way, man. I'm not made of money. I don't want to have to spend a fortune to buy new jewelry that I like to wear. So these guys started Gothic Jewelry with the goal in mind to make it affordable for everybody. And they have succeeded at that very, very well. And if you head over to gothic.com, that's G-T-H-I-C.com, you can check out everything that they have to offer in all their different lines. Now, my personal favorite is their Nordic and Viking inspired stuff. And I wear that on a regular daily basis. I feel like it is a good extension of myself and my individuality and the way I express myself. But they have a little bit of something for everybody, man. They have themes like skulls and animals Marine stuff, gothic stuff, occultism, religious pieces, pretty much anything for anybody. And they have bracelets, necklaces, earrings, rings, all of that stuff, man. And as an added bonus, if you see anything you like and want to try something out, you can use the code TANK20, that's T-A-N-K-2-0, at checkout. It's going to give you 20% off your entire order from Gothic. So once again, that's www.gthic.com, tank20 at checkout for 20% off of your entire order. And once again, a big special thank you to Gothic Jewelry for sponsoring this podcast episode. Well, let's get on with this one, man. Today's guest, most of you probably know from doing vocal analysis and reactions on YouTube, 
Or more recently, you may know her as the person who shoved a camera down Will Ramos's nose to look at his vocal folds, which was a fantastic video, by the way. And if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend checking it out. But today's guest for episode 11 of the Back Lounge podcast is Elizabeth from The Charismatic Voice. Elizabeth, welcome. Hi, Tay. It's <laughs> nice to see you. This is this is so funny because like we see each other every day on on <laughs> YouTube, mm -hmm. but like don't often have times to actually talk. Yeah, I feel like we need to make more of those times where we yeah. just chill and play Jackbox. Yeah, I was gonna say it's like <laughs> the most interaction that we've we've had has been on like you know playing Jackbox and stuff like that. I think I talked to your husband more than I actually talked to you. <laughs> Yeah, you guys are tight. I know a lot about your life, just so you know. <laughs> so That's I get awesome. I get updates about like Claire and and you know fatherly life sometimes. Yeah. It's kind of fun. Oh, and you're gonna you're gonna be experiencing all that soon. By the way, happy yeah. happy break. You're taking a break from filming for a while, which is exciting, yeah. but you're gonna have your hands full very soon. <laughs> yeah, I know it. We officially are on maternity leave. Uh, really, it was supposed to have started Monday, but I've had a lot of extra stuff kind of boil over. So uh, I did finish all of the recordings up on Sunday for two months worth of videos, oh which is a ton of videos. Yeah. I mean, so. I can't, I can't <laughs> even, I can't even make the time. Like a couple weeks ago, I took a week off of YouTube from like, just not do, I didn't, I needed it mentally. I was like, uh -huh. I can't do anything uh -huh. for a week. And I couldn't even make the time to do like a week worth of just burner videos because I just <laughs> didn't have the time. And then when Kirk no. said you guys had done like two months of videos, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of videos. It's taken a lot of planning and on top of that, um, we also were gone for two and a half weeks for Kirk's surgery at one point. Mm -hmm. So we had videos that we stacked up for that as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a lot, a lot of careful planning. Yeah. I mean, and your videos aren't short by any means. <laughs> no, no. And we're, I, we do a lot of research and preparation yeah. for all of them as well. So the amount of time in the video is, you know, expand that a lot yeah on the back end it's interesting you how, know. yeah it, it, well it's interesting how different we all do things too because my research and preparation is okay when does this band have an album coming out what mm -hmm. number of singles is this from the album or whatever and the majority of my research actually comes during the editing um huh. be, just because of the way that i do things yeah um but i see my average video is 15 to 17 minutes where yours are getting up there around the 30 range. Yeah. It kind of depends on how long the video is, yeah. right? but I'd say definitely most of our videos are above 20 though. we you know, if it's a three minute song, it probably is going to be a little bit less than 20. Yeah. I always find it funny. Um, you know, a lot of artists watch reactions now. Yeah. Sorry. You probably, <laughs> You can probably hear my kid in the background. <laughs> oh, actually, I don't. Oh, I man. Don't right now. J J oh, a little bit. Okay. You'll, you'll probably hear it at some point, man. You're going <laughs> to you're gonna be very used to that soon. Um, <laughs> right? So I always find it funny. A lot of artists are watching reactions now. But um, Ronnie from Falling in Reverse, who's very yeah. known for doing them on Twitch and watching, I always think it's funny because, let's be real, the majority of re reactions on YouTube are... are under 10 minutes because a lot of people mm -hmm. are just watching the songs and then giving an opinion and stuff so when ronnie watches those he seems like he has the patience for it and then when he gets i've seen him get to like <laughs> mine yours um julia's and mark's and stuff i remember when he did the i'm not a vampire my video was about 30 minutes long because i i did a reaction to the original because i'd never heard it oh. and then and i remember when he pulled it up he's like 30 minutes bro for a four minute song he's like come on i don't have time for this <laughs> <laughs> so it's always funny too but so yeah <laughs> when when are uh when are you due at the end of this month um you know my original due date was may 30th okay but, uh we have a very big baby oh yeah <laughs> so uh we've been told that if i haven't delivered by may 23rd they will induce me okay and then add to that some family history and other other things about the baby that uh, 
they say, hey, you could really deliver now at any time. My sister delivered right at 37 weeks, which is uh, uh, five days away. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Are you, it's like really close. <laughs> are, you, are you nervous, honestly? A little bit. Yeah. Not too much. Um, I feel pretty capable and I've been uh, staying very active throughout my pregnancy. So I think that my body will handle it pretty well. Uh, it's always, I think when a woman is approaching that moment where she's about to have her first one, you go, okay, are we going to have to at some point go to an emergency C-section? And especially because he's really big, that's a more likely possibility. Mm -hmm. And that part, uh, that concerns me a little bit just because I know that there's a much easier recovery process um, and it it's ultimately healthier for both him and for me yeah. if we can just go the normal way. Mm -hmm. So that's the only thing I'm a little bit nervous about, but I've done a lot of reading and classes online to be as prepared as I can. Yeah. It's, I mean, <laughs> it's, it, that's pretty much all we did too. I mean, you know, Claire, when Claire went through her pregnancy, it was so... I, I, I told her this the whole time, and especially when we got to when she went into labor... Obviously, I'm not the one that's going through the physical birthing process, but there was something that like when it was time, there was like this weird instinctual thing that went through my head where it was, I don't know how to accurately describe it. I mean, I think anybody that's gone through a pregnancy, um, whether it's the mother or father or anybody would know what I'm talking about, but it was wild. I mean, it was like... <laughs> we were she was late she was like three days late oh and, man and <laughs> i remember when we got to the last two weeks she was just like i want this to be done <laughs> uh -huh. and um you know when we went to the hospital we actually had to go that route where her labor was at about the 24 hour mark they were like you need to really think about having a c-section here yeah like and she did and to be honest you know she told me she probably would do it the same way again because yeah. it, it was just it was what it was but man again i know i'm not the one physically going through it but being with her through that process made me look at her a little differently in the sense <laughs> of like and, and most women to be honest i was like she she's an absolute warrior like, I was just amazed. And then when the kid was born, I cried my face off and, you know. Good. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I hope uh, Kirk cries too. <laughs> oh, dude, he will. I know, okay, I know Kirk well enough now to tell you he will. And if he doesn't, I, I don't know. There's something well, wrong with shocked. him. <laughs> like, <laughs> right? It's, it's fantastic. And then you'll, you'll probably, you know, get used to it real quick. But, I mean. I admittedly am a pretty selfish person in the sense of I want to be able to do what I want to do whenever I want to do it. And then the day one of Ingrid being born, it was like, I have, to, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then you're going to be doing reaction videos and vocal analysis stuff. And she, you know, when she starts moving, she's going to be pounding at your door and yelling and yeah. <laughs> it's going to be great. I'll talk about a child. Yeah. Uh, vocal folds and how yeah. they're different from humans and why they can be so loud. <laughs> right? It'll be great. Yeah, it makes for it makes for entertaining content. There's I've been in the middle of reactions where she's <laughs> she's nailed my door open and I've had to be like, oh hold on, <laughs> oh, no, so, just a second. Yeah, but uh, were you really nervous when when that time was coming up? Oh yeah. Yeah. I yeah it was I mean first time parents for both of us and we were just like. I, I, I can't explain it with words. It's just such a weird feeling. It's like, as we got closer to that date, I was like, this is real. Not that it wasn't <laughs> before, but like, it, it's like, it, it's wonderful. It's frightening. It's like magical, but scary. <laughs> like it's, it's everything. It's crazy. What about, um, I'm really curious. Uh, I've been experiencing this nesting instinct, which is way more intense than I thought it was. Yes, did that happen to Claire too? Oh, absolutely. Did it make you laugh? Like, um, just a little bit? Maybe. I can't remember. Maybe. I definitely remember her, like, 
Okay, so here's a good thing. Like her uh, her cravings for foods were funny because <laughs> we never did like tons of fast food or anything. And then somewhere about halfway through her pregnancy, she's like, "Can you go get me McDonald's?" And I was like, <laughs> "What? <laughs> like really?" So it was like a lot of that, a lot of nesting. And then we have two dogs, and one of them is he's just a doof. He doesn't know what's going on. But our our female dog, it was like she knew. She'd cuddle with Claire every night Aww. and be really protective, and it, it was it was just it was a wild experience, man. I think we're we're good with just having one kid, but <laughs> it was it was a it was a wild experience. And now she's just over a year old, so oh, yeah. she's walking, she's climbing everything. She's she's very interested in music, which I think is really cool. You can put anything on, and she's just like really really intrigued by it. And early on. We had a very rough first couple months um, from some some bad advice from people at the hospital. Mm. Um, I'm talking like two months, uh, and this is not normal. I don't mean to terrify you, but I'm talking two months of almost like 16 hours a day of just crying. Oh, I mean, it was it was it's... mentally. I've never been so Sucks. mentally drained in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but then when we found out what the what the issue was from our pediatrician everything changed and it was fine but there were times where we couldn't get her calmed down and mm -hmm. one day i just started trying everything music just something on the tv for her to look at and focus on and we realized she likes metal <laughs> <laughs> this isn't surprising is this surprising to anybody <laughs> i mean i told our pediatrician and our pediatrician is like yeah that makes sense to a baby it would probably be like white noise and i was like oh that makes sense oh. so but uh but I'm I'm just I'm happy and excited for you guys because it's it's it, every now that I actually am a parent. Whenever I find out I have friends that are having kids and stuff, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be so fun! Like, <laughs> you're gonna know exactly what I'm talking about now. <laughs> have a lot of relatable points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but um, man, you know, there's I feel like there's there's so much stuff we could talk about. So I'm just gonna start at the basics because while I do know a lot about your background. I've never really talked to you about it and I would like to know, but, cool. uh, you have a very intriguing background and I would like to know about your upbringing because there were a couple times on your channel when you did like first time reactions to things mm -hmm. that I told Claire or Claire <laughs> told Kirk, <laughs> Kirk. I was like, <laughs> I was like, there's no way she's never heard this band before. It's impossible. And then Kirk, <laughs> and then Kirk told me about some of your background growing up and I was like, okay, that makes sense. So, yep. starting at the beginning, you grew up in central Washington. Yeah. And got into piano and singing and dancing and all that. You were it was you were at a pretty young age when you started getting into music, right? I was really young. Yeah. Because my mom was teaching both of my siblings, my elder siblings, piano. And she was a piano and voice teacher as well. So, I, I'm guessing I was just wanting to always do what people in my family were doing. So I was begging to take piano lessons. I think she finally started me at four, but I was already, you know, playing and dinking around and trying to copy everything I saw at a young age and singing a ton. Mom said I was singing like before I was even speaking in the crib because there's so much music around. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I started very early in music and really in classical music. So primarily doing things like Bach festivals in the summer and uh, appreciating, <laughs> appreciating, I think, really intricate music at a very young age. And then uh, other than that, the other musical exposure was really in church a lot because my grandfather was a Southern Baptist minister and he had this barbershop quartet that he went around singing um, sort of not really revivals but they sang and actually toured quite a bit at churches and that meant that I, either he was pastoring and singing amazing grace and shaking the rafters at the church mm -hmm. or i was hearing them sing in barbershop quartets so basically growing up i was doing classical music primarily and getting some musical influences from church as far as what my parents listened to or sort of fun fun music around the house it was it tended to be focused in those directions. Uh, there was a little bit of country in there though, because my dad liked country. 
and I grew up on a farm, so yeah. <laughs> like, there's going to be a it's little a necessity a little in there, right? Um, but uh, a lot of Disney, tons of Disney. Mm-hmm. We love Disney. So that's that's really where the musical background is from. When it came to things like rock or metal, I know my brother got a little bit into that at one point, um, but uh, it wasn't... I. I wasn't into it at all. Yeah. That wasn't something we would hear on the radio, and I honestly just didn't have a whole lot of radio exposure other than maybe a country station every now and then. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of what people um, form as their musical foundation is whatever they grew up around. So mm-hmm. for me, similarly to you, my my aunt and my grandparents are very into um, classical music and operas and musicals. I mean, anytime I'd visit my grandparents, it was a guarantee that the soundtrack to Phantom of the Opera was on their stereo in their house. Oh, wow. Like, almost guaranteed. I probably Uh know every word to every song on that album still to this day just from hearing it when I was, like, (laughs) seven. Yep. Um, And, you know, when you start getting older, at least for me, was when I started discovering stuff in other realms. And it was usually, like, Mm -hmm. a friend's older brother that had some random metal CD or something like that. But... (laughs) Um, so you, you had this, this musical background at a super young age. You're constantly surrounded by it. When you started getting into your teenage years, I saw that, um, you know, you've had an extensive schooling and stuff, but not just in the United States, you went to France and you also later lived in Germany and stuff like that. Yeah. Was that, uh, when were, when were you in France? Cause from what I read, I think you, you went to school there, right? Yeah. Uh, it was a very purposeful decision to essentially, take a break year between high school and college um, and went with the Rotary Exchange Program to France for a year. Through that exchange program, you're automatically going to be enrolled in a French high school as well. So I was essentially did another year of high school over there. But because I was so interested in music, I told them right away that I wanted to be involved at a conservatory in the area and have some musical education that was going. And so I ended up um, getting into the French Conservatory in Rouen, which is really difficult to say. <laughs> and it's about, it's northwest of Paris, still on the Seine River, a very uh, large city. If you've ever seen um, the cathedral that Monet point, uh, painted over and over with different colors, that's mm-hmm. the cathedral there. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's really pretty. That's awesome. And so I did schooling there and got in uh, to the voice program and just went for it. So I ended up taking a full load at the conservatory, actually reduced my high school load a little bit, um, was just in school a lot. Yeah. (laughs) But that was great because that meant that I learned French very deeply. I was living with French families and uh, I came back and I had problems with English words sometimes. (laughs) So that was good. (laughs) Did you did you enjoy living in France? I loved it. Really? Uh, it was hard at first. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I think especially coming from I think a very conservative background to uh, living with a French family. My first family was smoking tons. Had a lot of uh, a lot of relationship problems <laughs> within the <laughs> family, and that was just not what I was used to. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That was really tough the first few months to adjust to, but then I, I did adjust and I thought it was a really life-changing experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I highly encourage people to do an exchange like that. Yeah. Every time I've been to France, I've just gotten yelled at. Oh, I'm I don't, sorry. Because I don't know French. <laughs> like, I, I, remember, I remember literally the first time I ever went to France, we, had, we got there and we had a day off in Paris. And our, the, the tour bus that we were on was parked outside of the venue and right next to the venue was a laundromat and none of us had done laundry in like a week. So we're like, oh, okay, cool. Let's, let's go. We go in and everything's in French, of course, as it should Mm -hmm. be. We're in France. And, uh, I remember the bass player I was working for went up to the attendant at this laundromat and asked for help because everything was in French. And he was like, Hey, Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry. Like we, we don't speak French. Is there any way you could help us? And she just looks at him and goes, American? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And she just points to the door and starts screaming at us in French. And I'm just like, oh, man, cool. <laughs> like, yeah. But but I um, we had quite a few days off in, in France on that tour. And I actually I loved some of the culture, man. Like after shows, we would just walk around on some of the streets and go to some of the street vendors and the food carts and stuff. And it was just mm -hmm. so good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, overall, if I see France come up on one of my tour dates, I'm just like, meh. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was there. So I was there for that entire year and have gone back a couple other times. But one of the big other chunks was almost, a, I was about a decade later when I was in Bordeaux singing with the opera company there. And the same sort of thing where I just really, I do enjoy the culture a lot. I have to say, I think the food is quite nice as well, oh, especially so the good. bakeries. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's one of my favorite parts of touring is food. <laughs> food. Yes. Yeah, right? for sure. And Amazing. it was funny. So a couple days ago from right now when we're filming, you actually, I think it was yesterday. <laughs> I have no sense of time anymore. <laughs> um, you released your uh, reaction and vocal analysis of Spaceman by Electric Cowboy. Yeah. And people were, I saw people get really excited and really surprised because they're like, she actually broke down some of the German parts. And I was like, well, yeah. you guys know she like performed and lived in Germany, right? Like, <laughs> so how, um, mo moving on from the, the French stuff, how did you wind up in Germany? So that's a, that's a little bit later. Okay. So France was essentially from like 18 to 19 years old. And then I came back and did college in the U S but I did one and a half years at Pacific Lutheran University and knew immediately I was going to transfer and go somewhere else. So I decided to take half a year and go to China. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that was fun. I went to China for a little bit uh, for a semester, um, studied some Chinese art song and got some more culture, just some more world influence. So I could, I feel like, start putting together a little broader view. And yeah. then uh, transferred to Oberlin, got my bachelor's degree from Oberlin, got into Curtis, my dream school. That's um, so good for classical music and got my master's degree from there. And then from Curtis, I, uh, I was, I had an audition there for a man named Eitan Pessin and he actually tried to get me to go a year earlier, but I wanted to spend one more year at Curtis. You basically stay there as long as you want to. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. And it's a full ride too. It's like, it's a dream <laughs> school. Yeah. 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 Like, wow. Okay. This sounds great. Um, and, uh, so I stayed another year and then I went to Dresden where he'd set up a, essentially like a, it's called a young artist program essentially. So where you're singing some big roles, covering some big roles and getting a lot of extra training to make sure that you can jump into those roles without, uh, without some of the last moment kinds of things that happen sometimes at other mm -hmm. opera houses. And that was a great program, and they also helped with the German. And I lived there in Dresden for a year, consistently also um, getting things like German diction lessons. At first, it was German intensive. Uh, of course, in the opera house, most of the time, we were speaking in German as well. I will say, I think that with France, partly because it was eight years earlier with France, uh, we hadn't developed as much technology and regular English usage, I think, in other countries. So I was living with families where I had to speak French all the time. Whereas in Germany, I was living on my own, but I had to speak German to function in society. As a result, my, my French language was, by the time I got back to the U.S., it was primary that I thought oh, wow. in French, I dreamt in French, all of those things and had a little difficulty switching back. When I came back from Germany, I still had a little bit of that, but not to the same degree I had uh, with French. When you were in France, well, I'm trying to do the math. Was that like early 2000s? <sighs> yeah, it would have been 2004 to 2005. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh man. Let me tell you, <laughs> they had lots of opinions about our politics too. <laughs> it was just like, oh gosh. As most I think it was not do, long but, yeah. after Freedom Fries was a thing in the U.S. <laughs> so, <laughs> I forgot about that. Right? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. It I just is, had to it, abstain from a lot of things. Yeah. it's And, um, I, God, I, that just threw me off because I forgot <laughs> that they tried to make Freedom Fries a thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh <laughs> man. Um, so, and it's, I, I relate though to what you were saying, um, about languages, like thinking about it all the time and stuff. So when I was younger, mm -hmm. I, I took Spanish because mm -hmm. I grew up on the Southwest side of Chicago and we had a very large Spanish speaking community and we were only offered French or Spanish. And for me, I was like, Spanish is going to be more useful. Yeah. And it did get to a point where after my fourth year of Spanish, I was like having dreams where I was conversating in Spanish and I was like, this oh, is great. wild. <laughs> like, That's great. So yeah. I relate to that, but I've, I haven't used it in years and I've been uh, taking German lessons now. Ooh. Um, because <laughs> yeah, the majority, the majority of viewers on my channel somehow ended up being German. And Ooh. I'm also, I, th I think, you know, and as most other people do, but later this year I'm doing the U S tour with electric Callboy. And congratulations on that. Oh, it's, it's gonna amazing. be fun. And I and I wanted to, I wanted to get my German well enough by then <laughs> that I'm not gonna tell them. I just one of these days I'm just gonna start rambling something off and see it, see if I can do it. Um, amazing. But it that's that's gonna be a fun situation because yes. this is the first time in my life I've been able to just pick and choose a tour and take it just because I think it's going to be a fun, good time rather than taking it out of the necessity of having to work. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the fortunate things about this whole pandemic situation is, you know, we're not exceeding luxury by any means with what I'm doing on YouTube, but it, it's paid our bills, which that's the yeah. only thing I can be grateful for. Or not the only thing, but I, how do I work? It's the most necessary it, yeah, thing. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the only thing I ask for. It's, I'm very grateful for that. There we go. So I don't need to take a tour to make money for us. I just want to do it because the, the, I'm all about life experiences, and I think it's just going to be so fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I started touring when I was 18, and um, I dropped out of college, actually, to start touring. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my, 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 my dad was very, <laughs> yeah, my dad was very supportive of it. He uh -huh. was, he, cause he's one of those kinds of people that's again, life experience, like, Hey, you know, you'll, you'll learn a lesson either way. So do what you want to do. The rest of my family, on the other hand, like my grandparents, especially for years, years and years, probably until like I got married, they were like, yeah, you ever think about going back to college instead of mm -hmm. being in a band? I was like, well, I haven't been in a band in 10 years. I'm working for bands. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> Big difference. So, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's fun. I don't feel like I have to do anything touring-wise, and nor do I want to go out for a long time because I want to be home with Claire and Ingrid. Yeah, but, exactly. um But, man, just, just from the background that you just told me alone, I'm like, you've got to be one of the most cultured people I've <laughs> Matt, <laughs> done a but, lot of traveling. <laughs> yeah, but also, but also, and I think most people that know you know this, but a big nerd, and I say that in a very <laughs> positive way because thank you. It yes, is a I'm, very positive thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am the same. In fact, I, I gotta ask you about this because uh, again, when I was reading some of your background, and it it says proclaimed nerd um <laughs> yes. it said you're really 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 into math i like math oh i like i sorry <laughs> <laughs> like whenever we get to jackbox into the trivia murder party whenever the math one comes up i'm like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good it's uh yeah i like math a lot i i really i was uh, always from a young age, pretty advanced in math and, and going further. I, I like the way it makes you think in interesting ways, the logic behind it, but then also how you can sort of take that and just apply it to um, different kinds of thinking in life. I think that's fascinating. But I loved calculus. That was probably my absolute favorite math. <laughs> and I got excited because I took it my junior year and then they yeah. had no higher math class for me to do anymore. I was bummed. Yeah. So I had a, a year off and then I got to France and took it again in French. And I got really annoyed <laughs> because I would get docked for not having the correct grammar no. to describe math. And I'd say, you just need numbers. Like you can see how I'm thinking in numbers. Why yeah. I, and so I also was really annoyed because they took long processes at one point and I taught some French kids how to do the shorter American process and yeah. the teacher got mad at me. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, like, dude, I, I didn't love math. I actually, I took pre-calc my junior year of high school mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and immediately was like, can I go back to algebra too? (laughs) No. Like, like, I'm just, I I was more interested in in science and history type stuff in school. Mm -hmm. Um, But I will say math, I'm I'm glad I took as much math as I did because it helped me a lot um, with a career as a roadie, actually, believe it or not, in different ways. So early on in my career, I was a merchandise manager. And when you start doing merchandise for bigger bands, that's where all that math comes back. Uh-huh. I'm talking like bands that are selling hundreds of thousands of dollars of merchandise a night. Uh-huh. And then I have to do all the accounting on that every single night. Oh. So Ooh. all of that comes <laughs> all of that comes back and mm-hmm. helps a ton. And then going into the teching side of things, you're using a little more geometry than anything else, especially mm-hmm. with, with audio and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I do... I do get people's annoyance with math, but whenever I whenever I hear that old argument where somebody's like, you know, kids usually in high school, why do I have to learn this? I'm never going to use this. I was like, oh, you will. You just don't mm-hmm. know when you're going to. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Most recently, I had to really fall back on some physics background. And that was when I was doing, last summer, I was doing a class with Ingo Tietze, who's like the, the guy when it comes to vocal research. He's... He did some of that first research on SOVT exercises and singing through straws, et cetera, et cetera. And he's a physicist from Germany originally who now oversees things like the Journal of Voice and all kinds of vocal science foundations. He uh, wrote a textbook that describes um, voice science, essentially, and it is it reads like a physics textbook. You go through it and you're making calculations for air pressure everywhere and then accounting for different um sort of different surfaces where the sound can bounce off it's it was very intense Mm -hmm. in that summer course i took with him and i was so happy that i liked math (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah there's so much about voice that i've learned um from watching you know channels like yours and julia's and mark's and stuff you know being somebody that played an instrument i never thought that much about voice I didn't Mm. think that there was that much that went into it other than just (laughs) knowing how to make the sounds that you're making. And now that I'm learning so much, I'm just like, this is, this is wild. I actually have a vocal lesson with Mark on Monday. Oh, yay. (laughs) He's such a good teacher. Yeah. Cause I really really like Mark. Mm -hmm. I I used to do background vocals in a band and Mm -hmm. screaming and growling and stuff like that. (laughs) And I don't think I, I knew that. I've I've <laughs> been I've been I'll have to send you a clip later. I've been wanting to do vocal covers on my on my channel just for fun. Uh-huh. But I don't know what I'm doing. And I get <laughs> I get very self-conscious about it, even though I'm sure it's fine, but I know how to make this I, I, I basically just learn from listening to other metal dudes and just mimicking what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And I have a feeling a lot of people in metal do that. Yeah. Um But I would like to actually know how to do it. Cause I, I actually sent a clip to Mark and he was like, it actually sounds good in terms of like, it doesn't sound like you're doing anything wrong. Like you're going to damage. Mm-hmm. He goes, it sounds forced if that makes any sense. And I'm like, it's funny that he said that because I've always felt like that. I felt like I'm uh-huh. exuding more than I need to. Yeah. And like that you have something that's kind of in the way that you're trying to get. Yeah. Past. Yeah. So I, mm-hmm. I'm starting to find all this vocal stuff, very fascinating. And <laughs> Speaking of the science behind it, I don't know if this is common knowledge. I'm just going to say one thing, and if it's not public knowledge, just shut it down. Okay. Will? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's Pe- So knowledge. people know about that. Yeah, the, okay. the video has not come out yet, but it is. Yeah, I know knowledge. that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So for anybody that's listening that doesn't know, and I'm sure a lot of people do, you know, I was actually about to say, when you're talking about vocal science, I feel like you're going to, I, I feel like this video when it comes out, is going to be a game changer for harsh vocals, to be honest. Um, <laughs> so the base, the basic story is you guys got Will from Lorna Shore and flew him out and put a camera down his throat. <laughs> so the video is not out yet, but I got to know about, like, I'm picturing you, Will, and Kirk just, like, in an Airbnb <laughs> hanging out. I've, I got to know a little about this. We had such a good time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really... It was fun, and Will is just a really fun person to hang mm-hmm. out with, too. It was great. It was great. Um, but then add to that that 
from the vocal science perspective, it was just a total dream trip for me. So we all yeah. went up to Salt Lake City because that's where Dr. Ingo Tietze is. And I knew that Will would be in great hands, great research hands. And Amanda Stark, who is, um, she's also a professor that's up there and works more I would say works more on the speech pathology side, but does a lot of the scoping. So she helped out with that class last summer as well. And she's been one of my main contacts. Uh, very, very, very interesting person and very accomplished in tons of things. So she's the person that ended up doing the scoping. So putting cameras down will start to help us. She helped us organize everything. And I was shocked that Ingo even wanted to come along for the day because I yeah. felt like, oh, you're so amazing. I get actually <laughs> shy around Ingo, which that's, 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 it's very rare for me to be starstruck. Yeah. And I'm starstruck around Ingo. That tells you how amazing his research is. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, we put the camera down Will's throat. We had a couple different things we tried out and other tests as well. The one that was most impressive, though, was the one, the camera that's a flexible scope. It's like a little wire that goes up your nose and then down the back of your throat. It's like a really, really evil COVID test. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But they do numb you up. Um, and then you have a bird's eye view looking down onto the vocal folds. And it's not just the vocal folds, it's the entire vocal tract. And whoa, that was amazing to see. There has been some research done on harsh vocals. There's some that's out there. There's not a ton, though. Yeah. There's way more research on classical singing, on clean singing, to get harsh, a uh, bird's eye view of a harsh metal vocalist that's of the caliber of Will, too, is incredible. And then to see <sighs> the way that he could manipulate the inside of his vocal tract, all the way from the vocal folds up. There are just multiple points where you can constrict and create sources of sound, essentially. That was truly mind-blowing. I had uh, Ingo and Amanda jaws dropped as well, saying no we've way. never seen this before. <laughs> So. That, so from your experience from, you know, <laughs> I, I got to imagine in the last couple of years of doing YouTube, you've probably seen more harsh vocalists than you ever had before. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> would you say that that I, it, Will is kind of like a different kind of animal in terms of a lot of other harsh vocalists from what you saw? Hmm. You know, I'm going to I'm going to fall back in the science brain. And OK, I feel that there's um, I think a lot of times when people have started doing a lot more research or they've really have been in that domain they there's like this lingo this talk that starts to happen and, and I find myself talking that way more than I used to and that is uh, I can't assess that because I don't have data on that yeah <laughs> Ultimately, that's, a, that's, a, that's uh -huh. I'm pretty sure I've heard people on the Johnny Depp trial say that on the stand <laughs> <laughs> oh boy uh, ultimately um, I think that there's not a lot of data out there mm -hmm. to base uh, that knowledge on or, or an opinion on even. So at this point, I'd say um, most of the time you can judge if somebody's doing something in a healthy way by longevity. Um, can they sustain it? Yeah. <laughs> right? Big, big question. And then as for where that source of sound for harsh vocals in particular is coming from, that's, we've seen you know, we have documented cases of a few different ones. The way that Will is doing it is different than anything I've seen documented before. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's somebody else out there that does a similar thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that as we study it more and more and more, and it should be studied more, that we'll start to maybe see a few trends and get just a little more revelation about what all is happening. Yeah, that's, I mean, that is just so fast. I'm looking forward to the, nothing against your other content, but I'm looking forward <laughs> to this video more than like anything that I've seen on YouTube. I mean, I'm so intrigued and so fascinated by the idea of doing that. And f for me, specifically to Will's case, I've been listening to metal since I was eight years old. I discovered Fear Factory at eight years old and that was it. Like I just kept <laughs> going. I've heard a lot of metal vocalists over the years and Will is in a very small pool of people that I've been able, that I've heard things like that from somebody. 
I mean, yeah. he, he really, to me, as somebody that doesn't know anything about vocals and is just a metal fan, he he definitely is a, a special voice that just came out of nowhere. And the crazy thing yeah. is, he's been around, he's been in other bands, and there <laughs> probably are people out there, like you said, that can do the same things. And they're, we've, we've heard it in other bands. I mean, you got Dickie Allen who can do wild stuff like that too. Mm-hmm. And, and But lately, over the last couple of years, and I... I I don't say this because we both do reaction and review videos, but I think due to a lot of these videos, some of these metal bands have started getting more exposure and more spotlight. And it it genuinely seems like a lot of people are very impressed by metal more so now than when I was a teenager, because when I was a teenager, we were looked at like we were weird. We're the weird metal heads. <laughs> and, and now everybody's getting into it. You know, there's sort of two things you said in there that I'm, I'm curious about. One is... Do you think this might be a silo effect? Because I've thought that at times too, but then I think, well, maybe it's just because I've become a more a bigger part of this community that I have mm-hmm. that feeling. But the other thing is, it's re- isn't it really clear to you at this point? Not just I think, but the way that labels are reaching out to us now and bands are reaching out to us saying, will you feature us on your channel? I feel that it's very clear that... Um, that having these videos does bring more appreciation for the artist and it does help promote and can boost bands in a really yeah. big way. So the the first thing you said when you said silo effect, what do you mean by that? Sorry. Oh, um, that because uh, we're in uh, more involved in a community, oh, okay. at least for me, that we get the echo back essentially of yeah. saying, yeah, this is, I feel people are growing in appreciation. I'm, I'd be really curious for example, um, if on a newly released metal album, what are sales like today versus sales from 10 years ago? Well, man, things change so fast in the music industry now that, I mean, we can look back uh, 10 years ago and I guarantee you physical album sales were better 10 years ago than they are now. <laughs> yeah. Like for sure. But I, I see people all the time on YouTube that um, viewers that comment that have specifically said, like, I discovered this band through a reaction. I went to their show. I bought merchandise mm-hmm. because I discovered them through a reaction. So the evidence is there that people are discovering new music from YouTube videos. And whether it's somebody like you that is doing full vocal analysis videos or somebody like me that talks about gear or even the person that literally, as we say, entertainment reactors that just mm-hmm. watch a song and then give their opinion afterwards. There's value in that because there's people discovering bands off of those videos. Yes. Um, and I 100% agree that, um, you know, reactions are, are a thing now because we're almost seeing, and I'm trying to say this as like objectively as possible because I know there's people that'll probably hear me talk about, there's people that hear me talk about reactions like, well, you're biased because you do them. It's like, Maybe, but I can, <laughs> I can I can still be objective and look at it from a like a, a marketing and business standpoint and give you an honest opinion from somebody that was mm-hmm. in the music industry. And what I see with reactions right now is it's almost like when Napster became a big thing. A lot of people were into it, but there was a lot of controversy as there mm-hmm. is with reactions. And it's becoming a new way of sharing music. I have had labels specifically tell me that they think reactions are just an evolution of marketing. And it's just mm-hmm. it's just what's in right now. And that's why a lot of these labels are interested in working with reaction videos. And they reach out to us with their schedules for the month. And I mean, that helps so much. Like every time I get an email from a label that's like, they're not even necessarily asking me to do anything for them. They're just giving me a list of all their videos that are releasing in a certain month. Yeah. And, it, and it helps a ton. It does. Um, but just like with file sharing and Napster and stuff like that, you have the other side of the argument where there are people that absolutely hate reaction videos. They don't care who it is. Like I, I see it all the time where they claim we're stealing music and we're, we're growing our subscribers and our viewer base based off somebody else's hard work. Um, and then the people that don't understand how copyrights work are like, Oh, you're making money off of these artists. I'm like, yes and no but mostly no (laughs) like like no the youtube has an algorithm that that makes sure that just joe schmo can't upload 
yeah a, a song and make money off of it that's not how yeah. this works um but my my argument against that is i have far more bands and labels reaching out to me to do reactions to their music than people that have put blocks on videos so <laughs> that true. right there tells me that these bands are fine with it these labels are fine with it like they almost welcome it at this point i so, i think they 100 percent welcome it yeah. with the people begging us to to cover band like we have a very very long list of would you please cover our band or the band mm -hmm. we represent but ultimately i have i have a, a personal sort of moral stone that i'm on um which is i feel that if one of my videos does not increase revenue for the artist then i haven't i haven't done a good job and that's just personally for me because I feel that I, one of my goals is to increase appreciation for what that artist is doing to talk about why it's why it's amazing. It's so mm -hmm. hard to be a singer. Like it's really really mm -hmm. hard. And people don't understand how hard it is or why some of the things are so amazing. So if I can impart that knowledge, um then that should translate directly into more streams, into more sales yes. for the artists, into more fans. So I should be bumping their revenue. Just business bottom line, they should see a revenue bump from one of my videos. Yeah. That if that doesn't happen, then ah, I I would I'd feel I'd feel bad in a lot of ways. And if there's I have recorded reaction videos before or analysis of something that I felt didn't shine the right light on the artist and just not posted it because yeah. That's not really my goal. Yeah, for sure. I, I agree with everything you're saying. I mean, mm -hmm. I get, I legitimately get excited when I do a reaction video to something and I see people that are like, wow, I've never heard of this band and this is amazing. Or wow, I've, yeah. I've been into this band, but I've never looked at it like this. And I've, I've had, um, I won't drop names just cause it was private conversation, but I've had the owner of an indie label tell me that they've seen direct correlations in presale numbers boosting mm -hmm. with timing up with reactions being released. Yes. And that right there, you know, tells me that this stuff does work. And you get you get a lot of different arguments from a lot of different people, especially when money becomes the thing. Yeah. You know, I we don't have to spend too much time on it because I don't want you I don't want to put you in the place where you're gonna give your opinion on this because this was <laughs> brutal, but a couple of weeks ago, if I'm being honest, I just I, I just had enough with the way that um Nightwish as an organization was handling their copyright blocks and strikes and all that on YouTube. And I made a video about it and it was the first time that I had ever faced the full brunt force of just a wave of negativity on the internet. I mean, I was, I'm not trying to get sympathy here, but like it was enough that it put me in a bad head space the rest of the day. Like I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, sorry. because people, people didn't watch the video. They just listened to the first minute of what I had to say, didn't listen to any of the arguments or proof that I was talking about, and then just went on the attack. And because they're fans of the band, when, you're, when your opinion of the band outweighs your um, ability to logic and reason and have a discussion, that's, a, that's, a, that's when it becomes toxic and it's a big problem. Mm -hmm. And that happened. But there's always those people that no matter what, they 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 don't listen to us talk about copyrights or how it works or anything and they're just like you're stealing their hard work to make money and i was like that's not what we're doing are there people out there that are trying to do that maybe i don't know i can't confirm that because i don't have proof of that but it is it is a little um it was a little oh what's the word i'm looking for it was a little disheartening when i you know i i put time into trying to talk about it a topic like that and it just was like literally had death threats <laughs> like it, yeah, it was that insane. shouldn't happen no and it, and it's but... not just one fan base this happens with a lot of bands and it happens with a lot of stuff yeah but you know it, it is what it is i mean we, I, I knew full well when i started doing youtube like i know how the internet is I mean, and I can't imagine for <laughs> you being a woman on YouTube. Like I talked about this with Vicky from the agonist when she was on the podcast 
she's like it doesn't it, she's like as a female artist it doesn't matter what what we post there will be comments that are just sexualizing everything and making derogatory oh, of course. comments and tons uh -huh. it's it just it's the internet is a ruthless place it's a ruthless place but it's also a, a really incredible place where you can yeah. build the kind of community that you want to as well and uh it's it, we get those kinds of comments absolutely on the YouTube channel, mm -hmm. but um, luckily I have uh, both a husband and uh, essentially a, a YouTube manager slash assistant in the Philippines, uh, Kirk and Paolo are their names, and they're really wonderful, incredible people, and they do try to help shield me some from that. Mm -hmm. I think I have a much tougher skin now than when I started, though. Oh, but yeah. Ultimately, when they see things come up that don't meet our community guidelines in a live chat or in comments in YouTube, that person will be blocked. Yeah. We're able to formulate a community that is very positive, is very music appreciation focused. And that's kind of incredible because then now you have, you're able to help those like-minded people essentially have a place where they can meet each other and discuss things they love together. Mm -hmm. That's it's amazingly powerful, but it takes it it takes actually quite a bit of work to yeah. get there. <laughs> it's it's one of my favorite things that's happened out of this whole YouTube, Twitch, whatever. Like, I, I will say a, a lot of those negative comments that I g got on that video and other videos, they're from people that aren't even subscribed to the channel. Usually, they're from people that just come across your video and say something dumb, and that's it. But the community that's built up, I mean, both, you know, I pop into your Discord from time to time. I see the people yeah. that are on there. I'm on mine all the time. I see the people that are on there. And I'm very proud and happy of the of the community that's built up. And when you when you bring up um it's a place for people to get together and light and talk about stuff, these communities are way bigger than us. Like, I think a lot of content creators would think like this is my community built around me and, and blah, blah, blah. And while you may have gotten pe you drew people into that community. I, I look all the time and I see people friendships, be two people on my disc that met on my discord server just got engaged. Oh, I love that. Like, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. That's, <laughs> that's so wild. And there's people that are planning. We have a, we have a tab on our discord of, um, People, people that have met on our Discord server that are planning meetups at concerts to just get mm -hmm. together and meet. We've had people travel to other countries to hang out with new friends they've made. And especially over the last two years during the pandemic, I think that is such a cool thing that so many people have met in these communities and really just developed good, positive relationships. I think people yeah. really needed that, you know? I think so too. Yeah. I, I think it, it was... Uh something that was absolutely essential for many people to help mm -hmm. through some of the initial lockdowns during COVID. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's been really cool. And mm -hmm. you know, your, your channel more so than any channel I've seen, at least in our community of music related stuff has just exponentially exploded. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like probably a year ago from right now, you're probably your channel grew four times in size within a year. Oh, I don't know if that's within a year, four times in size. I know that we had our 500K party, I want to say last August or July. Oh, okay. So it's a, it'll double. Yeah. Um, but the, I think also once you start getting to the, to bigger numbers, it's kind of hard for it to grow four times as fast. Yeah. I mean, I. <laughs> I, I've noticed that too, like, mm -hmm. and especially you, you see at different times of the year, stuff slows down. Like, so where we're at right oh, yeah. now, it's getting nicer out everywhere. There's less restrictions from COVID. So I've, I've seen my numbers going down because more people mm -hmm. are going out and not watching YouTube and stuff. And that'll change throughout the year. It'll go up and down and stuff like that. But what I, what I was curious about though, is cause I mean, obviously we've seen the channel grow, but like. I'm always interested to hear how people started on that. Like, I know originally you were just doing like, you know, vocal related stuff and then got into yeah. the analysis videos, but like, what made you make that jump to just start doing analysis videos? Uh -huh. Well, I knew I wanted it to be a vocal education focused channel. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really like reaction videos. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. I thought, um, 
it was very interesting. I, I felt like I wanted to have my own reaction to a thing and not necessarily um, wasn't, I wasn't as interested in um, maybe what another person was feeling as much. But then when I was at a conference and you know, actually I have to say here, Kirk recommended that I do reaction videos early really? on. Yeah. And I just said, no, I don't really like that. <laughs> <laughs> and this was happening for probably four or five months. And then I was with, um, I met Sean Daniel at, uh, at game sound con. It was a, a video game sound conference. Essentially. And we were chatting about YouTube and he had a, a sizable following on YouTube and he took a look at my stuff and then started pointing me in the right direction. And I, Started getting great advice from him at that point. I didn't know what a thumbnail was when I first talked to him. Yeah. So that was special. And then uh, fast forward about, I think it was about four months later, three or four months later, we were at NAM, and he'd invited me to go with him to a YouTuber party. Mostly, mostly guitar YouTubers, though one of the only other times I've been shy in my life in the last few years yeah. was when I was around Adam Neely oh, no <laughs> at this way. party. And I was like, because <gasps> I love his channel so much. Yeah. And I've uh, never directly reached out to him because I'm shy. That's like, again, yeah. like, there's, there you go. Dr. Ingo Tietze and Adam Neely. I there literally you go. watched one of his videos last night. His videos are amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And I looked at his videos a lot, actually, when I was thinking about constructing my own um, so he, anyhow, I was at this party with a bunch of YouTubers and, uh, another one of the guitar players there said, Hey, what if you did it, but had your own twist on it and you really explained things more. And I was talking about, Oh, it'd be fun to talk about the fifth element and how different people have sung it and whether that was accurate to the score or how they've changed a key or this kind of thing. And they said, yeah, that would be really interesting. I would watch that. That would be a twist on it. But would be really good. So I made that video and that video did not have Dimash in it because Dimash sang it in a different key. I narrowed down who I would look at though, according to singers that had sang it in the originally in the original key. And that was the first video on the channel that just immediately started drawing in extra views. And I realized at that point that I'd been telling people what I thought that they should be served. <laughs> instead mm -hmm. of listening to what they wanted. And what they wanted was reaction video. And I needed to take my material of vocal education and say, okay, you want a reaction video. Here's a reaction video with vocal education. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that entire perspective of instead asking, what do you want? Um, instead of what I think you should have. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was a huge shift. And it's and it's it's interesting because while even before you started doing it, there were there were a couple like vocal coaches that I remember seeing on YouTube. But now, after your channel's taken off and a few others and stuff like that, I feel like vocal coach reacts to is like the biggest form of reaction video on YouTube. I mean, every time I see a new thing, it's either singer reacts to, vocal expert reacts to, vocal coach reacts to. I've even mm -hmm. kind of poked fun at that a couple times where I've, <laughs> where I've checked out vocal videos. Like I checked out, um, Floor and Hank doing, um, mm -hmm. Phantom of the Opera or whatever. Yeah. And I, I tagged it as video. not a vocal coach reacts to. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And, and That's the, funny. And the funny thing is, and again, I don't want to put you in a spot where you have to give an opinion you don't want to, but for me, I see a lot of those videos and I'm like, is this person actually a schooled vocal coach or are they just a singer that's saying vocal coach because that's the tag that works right now? You know what I mean? Yeah. It just seems like there's too many. <laughs> I, will, I will have a two cents about that. Um, I think that a vocal coach is really anybody that coaches somebody in voice mm -hmm. and they don't need to have a degree. Yeah. Um, so you can be a vocal coach without lots of training. So it, it's a very, very wide and encompassing term. Uh, that means all kinds of people can claim it. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure that there are some people that don't have as much claim to it. Um, for some reason, people really like opera singer that, that yeah. we kept that for a long time. And that's, I think because it's just recognized that opera singers tend to have done a lot more study 
and building up, but I almost feel like that is diminishing towards other styles of singing where people might have done a ton of study as well. Mm -hmm. And the kind of reaction, or I would say very specifically, the kind of analysis I would look for is vocal scientist. That to me is very interesting. That's somebody who's really studied the mechanics of voice across all genres. And that's one of the reasons I like Julia's videos so much. Yeah. <laughs> she goes full on vocal science nerd. Yeah, 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 for sure. And, you know, I think I had a similar background to you in terms of the the, the direction with YouTube. Yeah. Um, when I, actually, when I first started, it was it was due to necessity. It was, the pandemic started, we couldn't tour anymore. And when that happened, like I'll, I'll never forget the day. Our la the last show we did was March 13th in Las Vegas. And then we got sent home and it was like, hey, we'll be off right. for two weeks. Then it was, hey, we're gonna cancel everything for two months. Yeah. And then it was, hey, everything's canceled until the end of the year. And we're just like, okay, I need to find something to do. And a, a friend of mine that I was actually touring with, he was my stage manager on that tour was like, why don't you try and do Twitch or something? He's like, you play a lot of video games. Like you, mm -hmm. you get into a lot of that stuff. Like that'd be cool. So I tried Twitch for maybe a month and I had like an average of three viewers watching every time. <laughs> and I realized that Twitch is very hard to get an audience on. It's hard to develop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think I noticed that reaction videos were starting to become a thing, but I also realized I'm in the unique position to give input that not a lot of other people have yes. that did reaction videos, yes. but it did develop over time. I will say, if you go back and look at some of my earliest reactions, I was not doing what I'm doing now. Like <laughs> my first few reactions were literally me just watching a video and hoping that the allure of, Hey, this guy's an actual roadie checking out music. I was hoping that that would bank in on it. And I realized, I, I need to go further. So I was like, there was a certain point. I can't remember what video it was, but there was a certain point the first time that I ever like really sat and talked about gear. And then I put a pop-up in there with more details about what I was talking mm -hmm. about. Every, that was the moment that like all the comments on that video were like, do more of that. Yes, that. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's what this channel is now. I'm actually going to sit here and talk production and talk gear. And for me, I will, I'll, I'll fully admit too, like, I don't know everything, but this has almost been a form of education for me because every, <laughs> while I'm very good with um, instruments and brands and stuff like that, there have been moments in videos where I'm like, I have no idea what that person is using. And then I spend like way too much time <laughs> looking up information on, oh, yeah. there, there was one time and, and people on Discord can verify this because I asked them for help. I did a Sabaton video from 2005, I think. Ooh. It was it was before they had like the the get up that they do now. They were just in uh -huh. like leather jackets and all black. Like uh, Joachim had hair. Uh, he like, <laughs> but their old guitar player was using a guitar that I'm like, I have no idea what that is, but I'm gonna find out. And after two and a half hours of sitting here, paused on the editing, looking this up, I finally went to Discord and was like. Can anybody help me here? And those moments for me are actually really cool because I get yeah. to learn more about something than I already knew, you know? Yeah, and, I, I fully agree. And the music discovery is just amazing. I mean, we get yeah. so many people leaving us comments <laughs> that are like, thank you for showing me this band. I was like, no, I need to thank all of you guys for telling me to check out this band because I've discovered more music in the past two years than I probably have in the last 10. Right. It, it, it's super cool. It's amazing. And that goes back to the asking people what they want instead of saying, mm -hmm. I think you should have this on YouTube. I think that that is such a crucial distinction between when channels are successful versus not is when you're essentially polling your audience. Yeah. And I know when I first was doing it, it was all my own. I'd be going back through all of those comments, tracking everything yep same. now thank goodness um palo does the tracking of <laughs> what things are recommended because oh my gosh it's it has become so massive to mm -hmm. do really truly just it's an astronomical scale and but then i get this data back of these are the bands that people are wanting the most and i'm going who who is this 
and then I'll ask around and get some more information on them or we'll see things in live chat and get more information and backgrounds and that helps us make decisions for what content we're going to present next, which is amazing. Yeah. I, mean, I love, um, in particular, there's one, I did Rammstein for the first time like a while ago. Um, that's a hard copyright to get through, but oh yeah. got it through. Um, so did Rammstein and Deutschland was the first one. And then people recommended specifically Mein Herz brennt, mm -hmm. this piano version, like a stripped down version. I was amazed. The audience knows me well. They know what I'm going to like, I think, a lot of times. So that was such a beautiful and amazing video. I completely have to thank viewers for recommending that one so much. It was, there were totally right i loved it <laughs> yeah and it was a great it was a great video on your end i watched that too and it, it's funny too i hate well you know as well as i do when you're when you hear about a new band and i i think this goes with anything not just music it's hard to get into something that you don't know anything about so yeah. e even when people tell me about a new band they're like like i'll get a band where i'll see 20 comments in a row from people who are like check out this band mm -hmm. but, but that's all they say so yeah. it's like for somebody that's not familiar with that thing, you need to not necessarily sell them on it, but like tell them something that'll interest them. So yeah. I've had situations where I finally check out a band and I do end up absolutely loving it. And then I'll get people that are like, dude, I told you about this a year ago. And I was like, yeah, but all you said was check this band out. You didn't tell me that this was what this was. You know? Right. Uh, it was a very similar thing um, recently. Oh, shoot. What's the name? There was another band I just checked out that um, had uh, the lead singer had these amazing, powerful, operatic kind of vocals is how he's, he was described to me. And, oh man, I'm totally blanking. It's Howard Jones, I think is the lead singer's name. Oh, are you talking um, about from Killswitch? Yeah, from Killswitch. Well, formerly Howard, of Killswitch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's Howard Jones. Uh-huh. Perfect. Okay, so Howard Jones, they were trying to describe his voice and when they talked about things like these almost operatic, but then could be harsh, and they described a voice that had so many intriguing things to me, mm -hmm. that made me really want to cover him. Yeah. And ended up doing that on, on a My Choice Day, which is, uh, I think we have days when we're strictly doing what was recommended the most on the channel. And I promise that to people. Like I will, the things that you recommend the most, we will cover as long as we don't have some awful copyright thing that prevents it. And then uh, we have days that are reserved for patrons requests. Um, and uh, there's My Choice Tuesdays where that's probably when we have the most variety because I can bring in an opera song and analyze it and give all kinds of background on it. That's really fun. I think mm -hmm. people enjoy that sometimes. But it's also the day that I'm most likely to bring in something that isn't, that didn't get most recommendations. And it was for that reason that we finally analyzed Killswitch Engage. Specifically, it was for Howard Jones, though, because of comments talking about mm -hmm. his voice that intrigued me. Yeah, so Killswitch, this is going to be funny because of our different musical backgrounds. I've been listening to that band since 2003. <laughs> like... <laughs> That's amazing. Like, that was a high school band for me. That was a those guys. <laughs> those guys started breaking out when I was in high school. Now they had a different vocalist on their first album, and then Howard came in for their second album. And now, if, funny enough, Howard hasn't been in the band for a while, and that original vocalist is back. Oh. But for me and my personal taste, I love Howard with that band. Um, one of the funnest concerts I've ever been to in my life was actually Killswitch Engage oh. at the House of Blues in Chicago. It was Killswitch Engage. Dragon Force, uh, Chimera, and He is Legend. It was on Easter, <laughs> on Easter Sunday in Chicago when I was like 19 or something. <laughs> and Howard is just so good live. And the video that you covered, actually, that's one of my favorite live DVDs. Like, I have oh, it. Good. I literally have it sitting right here. Um, it, it's just yeah. fantastic. It like, was a really, it. really good capturing of the performance and it let me see him live, let me see how he was supporting his voice and moving on the stage and engaging. It was a, a great clip to get to analyze. Yeah, it was, it was super cool, man. And I I dig that. Like, I, I don't necessarily 
watch every video that you release. I'm sure that you can relate to that as terms of a YouTube. <laughs> I watch some of yours. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Like, and I don't mean that to sound offensive. It's just like, no, we are, we are people that have tastes just like anybody else. If you're covering a band like Killswitch or Electric Callboy or something like that, like, yeah, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> like I watch videos like most people watch videos. It's like, it's no secret with YouTube content creation, specifically reactions the people watch the stuff that they're already into. Not a ton yeah. of people go out of their way to try and discover new music through reactions, but there are a lot of people that do. Yeah, and playlists, I think, actually um, get people into, we've seen that happen, where they'll get into a band that is related to another mm -hmm. band through a playlist on the channel. Yeah. And that's where I think you get the most bang for your buck for music industry labels pr yeah as far as associating your band on a reaction or analysis channel with another band that's big yeah even for me listening to music i i'm like that like i think it's no secret to anybody in my channel that i'm like if the band is finnish swedish or german like i'll check it out because that's like <laughs> right. that's that's like my big thing but Aside, aside from YouTube, I, you know, I haven't seen you on much, but I know you guys used to jump on Twitch and, and play D and D and stuff too. You just, it's been a little bit on hold uh, just because of pregnancy. Yeah. <laughs> I the real can imagine. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, we, yeah, we had our D and D campaign going for a long time, but ultimately, um, it became really difficult for me to do because I had a very, very rough first about four months of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. First trimester was just, uh, it was kind of brutal. <laughs> so uh, I know that one of the sessions that we had where we were streaming, I was feeling like super bad. Yeah. So that and knowing that with baby here and, and everything kind of changing, we wouldn't be able to have a four hour session. <laughs> so it's a bit on hold for now. Um, not for lack of, of wanting to just play D&D. &D. <laughs> yeah. I haven't but. played in so long. Ah. I, like I used to in high school, I was really into it. And then uh, Magic the Gathering was one of my other really big things too. Like We can talk a lot about that. Oh, really? Oh. Do you play yeah. Magic too? Well, or I played to? Magic. I played Magic in middle school and high school with my brother. Nice. Um, and then uh, last fall, I got back into it with Kirk and... Uh, we actually are currently opening up a few Kamigawa cards right now. Oh, wow. Um, so <laughs> we really like it. And uh, have started um, getting into Commander as well. And I have a squirrel deck from Modern Horizons that I particularly love. And <laughs> because squirrels, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we, yeah. I like magic. <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I got into it. It was funny because when I was in high school, I I look back now and I, I was kind of a, a chameleon in the sense of social uh, circles. Mm -hmm. I was I was a three sport athlete, but Whoa, I was all but which I all, sports? um so I played I played soccer my whole life, but then my high school was so small we didn't have a soccer team that I started playing no. football. Yeah. <laughs> I went to a school, my graduating class in high school had 117 people in it, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I grew up in a, t probably somewhat similar to you. I grew up in a town of 4,000 people in the middle of a cornfield outside of Chicago. <laughs> so I, I, I played, um, in high school, I played football. I wrestled for a little bit. Um, I wrestled more through middle school. And then when I got to high school, I kind of dropped it, um, after a year because I just wanted to make time, but baseball was my big sport. I actually went to college to hmm. play baseball. Um, and, but I also hung out with like all the like stoner skateboard kids. And then I was a metalhead, and then I was also in band. And then I was also <laughs> into magic, the gathering. So it's like, I had all these friends from different social circles and we convinced our high school chess club to turn it into a, a tabletop club instead of just chess. So we started doing Magic the Gathering and oh, cool. like D&D &D and stuff in high school. And um, I fell out of Magic for a while, but once they started doing uh, Magic the Gathering online, it became oh, yeah. a lot easier to you know jump on and be able to play. And I haven't in a while. There's actually quite a few people on our Discord that play regularly. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, and I, I, I used to be super into that. But in terms of you know games and stuff, like video games have always been my thing. 
and a lot of that also i've at, at a later age i've i've dove more into the music and scores and stuff with video games um my at this point i probably say it's my most played game and favorite game of all time but i've been playing destiny since day one of the release like i played daily <laughs> and the musical score on that game with the visuals on that it's like that makes a sci-fi game like that so much more incredible to me <laughs> and i notice those things more yeah the adaptive score is really really good on that but yeah um if you're really into that you're gonna be excited when we release the video that's with marty o'donnell um i marty o'donnell is the original composer for halo mm -hmm. so his music has been used throughout the halo franchise of course and he also is one of the chillest, most awesome people to talk to. He was the person that introduced me to Sean, actually, at the Game Sound. Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah, a convention. Um, uh, Marty and I hit it off after he gave the keynote at a Game Sound convention a few years earlier. And we just started talking about classical piano. And just like, just, I don't know, we just hit it off and started talking about... Um, music and how it's developed in video games, what it was like when he was first composing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now he's just one of my favorite people to sit down and have lunch with or coffee. You know, it's great. I really, yeah. really like talking with Marty. So I asked if he would do an analysis of voice plays cover of Halo. And I actually, I put them into contact with Marty too, which was fun. Oh, nice. When they were first looking at it. And so Marty and I, uh, got together on Zoom and went through it. And it's so fun to hear how how he likes the way they've covered it and arranged it and what he was thinking about when he was first writing it. Oh, that's so um, cool. So I think like, from that perspective, especially if you love Destiny, that'll be really, really cool. Yeah. Like super, super I, cool. Video music is amazing. Oh yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I, I, I think I kinda just baited you with that because Kirk <laughs> Kirk did tell me you were doing that, and I wanted to see if you were going to bring it up when I mentioned Destiny. <laughs> yes. Um, dude, when he, when Kirk told me you were doing that, I was like, because because there's two different guys. There's there's two different composers that have done Destiny, and but Marty is has been doing everything since Destiny 2's release all the way through all the expansions they have now, and I mean there is a very diehard dedicated fan base for his scores for Destiny. Yes. I mean, die hard. So I'm going to insert a little a little thing here. Um, Marty's music has been used throughout. There actually was a massive lawsuit. Um, oh, I didn't even know anything so, about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that because his music is being used and it wasn't a work for hire position. So there's some oh. interesting things that surround that. Um, it's actually one of the sort of staple... Uh, game music lawsuits that exist. I don't know so how I didn't know about that. A lot of <laughs> a lot of interesting things, but um, yeah, his music has very consistently um, been yeah. used throughout the entire. It's it's iconic. It goes with the game franchise at yeah. this point. I mean, every time a new Destiny expansion has came out in the last couple of years, I think like the Reddit community is just like, what kind of music are we gonna get here? And it's yeah. and it's from the main title screen. It's like people people literally film their reactions to hearing the main title music on new expansions <laughs> yep. and pu and put it on Reddit because it's so yep. epic sounding, man. It's just that's that's so cool, man. And it's you know it's really cool the connections mm -hmm. that we've been able to make and utilize for content is so rad. I mean, you know, like I was I, I think I told you before we started. Yesterday, I filmed a podcast episode with uh, Peter Eversh, who is one of my heroes in terms of bass players. That's the reason I started playing. And it's so mm -hmm. full circle with this that it's like 13-year-old me would have never expected to sit down with him and, <laughs> and talk about this. And it's because right. of YouTube content. Totally. Yeah. It's so exciting, actually. Yeah. The, the way <sighs> we're incredibly fortunate is how I'd put it. Mm -hmm. Um, because we're in this position where we're, we've uh, developed our communities and we've really brought more to uh, the appreciation of these artists, now there are times that we get to talk with these artists and relate to them and ask them the questions that we have had burning inside yeah. for such a long time. I think it's it's pretty... 
it's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very cool, man. It's it's we we are definitely in a very fortunate and unique position to be able to bring a lot of that to the table. And yeah. even outside of that, like I know uh, just completely away from YouTube and content and stuff too, in terms of live music, I know you've, you've gone to some concerts of bands that you've discovered mm -hmm. um, off your channel. You guys went to that high lung concert that had to have been amazing. amazing. That was amazing. I'm going to share a little inside knowledge though. This is before it was public. I, uh, I was pregnant at the time and I had terrible morning sickness. Oh no. Um, and so we actually we had a, a seat that was really like close center and the bass started up and I felt like I was gonna puke. Oh no. <laughs> so, it was so funny. It was so, it was really incredible. We had to go to somebody, a medical person though, and ask if we could be relocated to where the bass was quieter because I was like about to puke on everybody in oh front of me. Oh my gosh. But we still, you know, we still got to see the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. We just uh, got relocated in the middle of the concert. <laughs> and it, Maria was so sweet, though. I was supposed to see her backstage afterwards, but obviously with the, as the situation was. Restrictions uh, and all that, yeah. Well, no, I think oh. just because I was so really sick. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were talking about COVID restrictions. <laughs> no. Um, no, I was just really, I was, I was so... I was uh, feeling quite nauseous at that point. So yeah. she extended an invite to see her the next day instead. And so she was so yeah. sweet about that. And she even got me, I told her at that point, just to keep it hush hush and explain to the situation. And she got me these like little chocolate coconut things that oh. were really delicious. <laughs> it's really sweet. Cool. like, feel better. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're coming back here again later this year. And, um, their, their tour manager, Patrick, is a guy who I've gotten to know, and I had him on here for an interview and stuff, because uh -huh. you know, I, I love, just as much as this, like, I love talking to other um, roadies in the industry from other yeah. parts of the world to get their background on stuff, because it's there's a big difference in touring from here and overseas and things that they deal with, but Patrick was saying, um, you know, they're coming back here, and he goes, any show you want to go to, let me know. And for some reason right now, nobody's coming to Nashville. Like the closest show huh. that High Lung is doing is Atlanta, which is four hours away. That's so strange. Why not Nashville? Um, I think it's oversaturated here, to be honest. Oh. I think there's so much That's music. A good point. I mean, there's there's a hundred stages on Broadway now. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there's a couple things that I've noticed. I think this town is so oversaturated with music um, that people uh ticket sales don't necessarily do great here even when mm -hmm. big bands come through and the crowds are really flat like they almost huh. have this like kind of impress me attitude uh -huh. and this is when i was working for country bands too i've done shows like we did a tour with brad paisley who's one of the big names in country music <laughs> i know that name i listened to him a lot in high yeah. school <laughs> so i've i've done multiple multiple <laughs> tours um, with Brad at this point, not working for Brad, but working for a band that opened for him. Mm -hmm. And when we did our show in Nashville, and this is Brad Paisley for anybody that's not familiar, huge name in country music. Uh -huh. That arena was like a third sold. Hmm. And it's, it's a pretty common thing here. So I think a lot of these artists just don't really care anymore. And there's also, it's also a big difference in venues here for the longest mm -hmm. time. We only had clubs or the arena nothing in between so oh. you're either talking a thousand 500 to a thousand capacity club yeah. or a seventeen thousand seat arena nothing really in between for anybody to play at and um, that would that would have needed to shift a bunch with sort of the current dynamic in music right for sure and over the past couple of years they have opened a couple new venues the problem is it all happened during the pandemic so mm. They opened a Brooklyn Bowl here, which is like 1,500 capacity, really nice club okay. venue. Um, it was supposed to open on like March 15th of 2020. And that's it. Literally, they couldn't have their first timing. show. Uh -huh. But it is finally open. I went and saw Ginger there a few months ago. Oh, nice. They were, they were so good. I was just... It was one of the rare times that I was really that blown away with how tight that band was. And how good they sounded live. I mean, they're a really good band. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it was just cool because I knew people on that tour 
but I didn't use any connections or anything. I just bought a ticket. Mm-hmm. I went and stood mm-hmm. in the crowd and watched the show. And it was funny because this was when Ingrid was uh, seven months old. Uh-huh. So we got her down to bed and then I was like, all right, I'm going to go catch this set and then I'll be back. So I had to like sneak out of the house and go see the set. And, um, I missed all the opening bands, unfortunately, but I saw Ginger's set and it was just cool. And it was, it was actually one of the first times in my life too, that I got, I got recognized from the YouTube thing. Oh. Like there were, probably, <laughs> there were probably, there were probably like two dozen people that came up to me when I was at that concert and were like, Tank? And I was just like, uh, yeah. And they're like, oh, dude, I, I follow you on YouTube. And I was like, this is wild. <laughs> this is this is interesting. Because <laughs> I'm not used to that. Like, Yeah. You know? Talk a little bit more about how that feels. Because I feel like that's that's <laughs> one of those moments. It's like. <gasps> I, I'm not used to it. You know, right. being being a roadie for bands. Um, I'm I'm well aware that when people go to concerts, they're there to see the band that I work for. They don't. They don't mm-hmm. know who I am. They don't need to know who I am. They just see the guy walking the guitar out on the stage. Uh, maybe some of the diehard fans for bands I've worked for that go to multiple shows, they know the crew. Like, we definitely mm-hmm. had some people with bands I've worked for that knew me by name because they knew I was the guy that was there. But yeah, yeah, it was it was it was humbling. But if I'm being honest, it felt weird because it's just never happened. It's like. I don't know. It was all this. And, and I'm. I, I probably don't give off this impression, but I'm actually a very introverted person. And I sometimes don't want people talking to me. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, but, but everybody that came up to me was super nice. Like it wasn't weird at all. It was people weren't like, um, crossing any boundaries or, or being weird or anything like that. It was just yeah. literally people that said hi. And that was, it was really cool. So, yeah. I mean, I imagine yeah, so it's like, a combination of uncomfortable, but but cool, but cool. <laughs> yeah. Like, did you have did you have a moment where you felt a little bit proud? Yeah, yeah. If I'm being honest, yeah. sure, of course. I mean, let's let's be real here. Like, I see so many YouTubers that say, "I don't care about the subs. I don't care about the numbers. I don't care about revenue." I'm like, dude, if that was true, you wouldn't be doing this. I'm sorry. Like people know how social media works. People look at those numbers. There may be one or two cases that I can think of off the top of my head where I I genuinely believe like people just don't care. Like Mm -hmm. some reactors that they, they don't care, but these are the reactors that are never reacting to anything mainstream. They're literally reacting to like underground deathcore bands that nobody's ever heard of. Mm -hmm. In that case, sure. You probably don't care. But you still care enough that you're putting it out and you want people to watch it. Of course. So there's, there, I, I think that there is a level of caring that is. Yeah. There's, otherwise, you wouldn't be putting it out for that, social media. Yeah. That was one of the things that kind of um, frustrated me with, you know, that video we were talking about earlier. Um, there were a lot of reactors that commented on it and showed me support. Uh, there were a lot that wanted to, wanted to show support but stayed neutral. Um, and I get it. Like, like we've talked about, there are some rabid fan bases that I think a lot of YouTubers are, are actively trying to avoid pissing off. And, you know, um, metal burb, um, this Canadian dude, fantastic guitar player. He does a reaction review channel where he, he listens to music and then he reviews what he thinks about it from the sound production and all that stuff. Um, he made a video recently called the problem with honest reaction channels. And Mm -hmm. His whole point was, uh, you know, and he, I will say he is, he's a very honest person. He's, he's said he doesn't like stuff that I absolutely loved and he's very honest with his opinion and stuff, but he was talking about why so many reactors have to constantly like keep a smile on their face and try and act like they like things that they don't. And one of the things he was talking about was upsetting diehard fan bases and stuff like that. And I've seen comments from other reactors, you know, specifically that were like, it's like, I'm not doing it for the views. I just love the band. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but when every single reaction that you post is Nightwish, Dimash, Baby Metal, and Ali Bata, yeah, you might like those bands, but we see what you're doing. <laughs> like, you know, there's no variety other than the, the 
the videos that are just getting tons and tons of views. So I think there is a problem um, with the YouTube community in terms of transparency and honesty, if I'm being honest. Um, it kind of bums me out sometimes because you'd think people would see through that, but they don't. I mean, I don't know. There's 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 a lot of clickbait. There's a lot of there's stuff. a lot of clickbait. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think there's like sort of two things I'd love to insert here. Yeah. One is that um, Kirk and I recently were working with a consultant agency, essentially on our YouTube channel, and trying to, you know, even though we're doing really great, we want to know how we can continue to get better. Like mm -hmm. that's just. That's how both of us function. We always want to grow. We always want to have a really thriving community. So what can we do to continue to improve it? And um, we talked some about primal branding and how often communities will gather around things that they're against. So I think it's possible for somebody to have a really honest reaction and be against something um, and still have a very thriving community it's on the other hand on our channel we're extremely positive and that is um what i would say is actually we're pretty against negativity mm -hmm. on our channel um it is definitely positive focused i want it to be a place where people can uh get away from a lot of negative things in the world and appreciate music mm -hmm. so um from that perspective i think i i told you before i've had videos where i thought the analysis wasn't as positive or I had some, it was maybe leaning more towards negative and that's why I choose not to release it. I don't think that I'm dishonest um, from um, liking things. And I've seen emails and, and conversations and comments about people as well. And then the other thing is, I think it's, I feel really lucky because <laughs> when I'm looking at how something functions, I don't have to have a reaction of, Ooh, I like this for it to be intriguing and interesting. I think if you know how the physics and the function of something works, then you can get into it and, um, and be delighted and appreciate it in a very honest way, mm -hmm. which I think, I think that might just be lucky that that's how I function. And so I'm able to keep that kind of positivity going. Yeah. I think I think you're right that um, maybe that's why I feel like I've always been able to be authentic on the channel and I've heard some other people or seen some other people kind of burn out as they pretended to like things. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there's there's a couple things you just made me think about that I, I feel like is worth being open about. Um, you know, the, I think you know me well enough at this point. I'm also a pretty positive person. Yes. And I was conflicted about that that video where I was talking about Nightwish because... On one hand, I was being super honest and open about my thoughts on what was going on with the, the copyright system that their organization has employed. But on the other hand, I, I did look at it afterwards and I'm like, this is not, this is not what I usually do. This is not the kind of content that I, and I even had some comments from people who were like, dude, I love your channel, but s stick to your positivity and stuff like, cause like hearing you talk about this stuff like this is, is like, it's just not you. And I, looking back now, I probably still would have released the video. Maybe I would have said things a little differently than I did. But um, I totally feel what you're saying about what you want to represent on your channel. There's been two music videos I can think of off the top of my head that I refused to release reactions for. Mm -hmm. um, both of them, I actually stopped recording in the middle of them. One of which <laughs> I won't say what they are because I don't want anybody to form any yes, kind of weird opinion, exactly. but, um, one of them, the lyrical content was not what I want to promote on my channel. It had some very homophobic slurs and negative mm -hmm. things in it that I was just like, this is, I, I, I personally am not comfortable putting this on my channel. Mm -hmm. Other reactors did. That's fine. It's their channel, whatever. But me personally, I'm not comfortable promoting that kind of content. Uh, the other video that I stopped, and this one was one of those where, I mean, I couldn't stop fast enough. I was like, there is no way I'm putting this on my channel. <laughs> the band was awesome. It was like a, um, it's like a symphonic death metal band. But uh, the music video, 
was basically a woman getting sexually assaulted the whole time. Oh, no. Like, first of all, <laughs> my thoughts in my head, I'm like, first of all, I'm not comfortable putting this on my channel. Second of all, who at the record label saw this and was like, yep, this is good. Sounds like, that sounds like a good idea right now. But at the same time, maybe there's something I missed. Maybe there's, mm -hmm. maybe there's a message in that that I missed or something. But if it made me that uncomfortable just watching a minute mm -hmm. of it, like you know what I mean? It's like if I'm yeah. not if I'm not a hundred percent confident and comfortable putting that on my channel, it's just it's not going to happen. Yep. And now, one of the things that you're doing too is you're having to sift through your own material that yeah. you're about to react to. So I don't even know how you like what your process is for picking videos. I when I was doing it before, Paolo was helping. I Paolo goes through the videos and makes sure that they're all good. But I had videos before where. I'm going, I'm sorry, there's a blip in the video here. I, I didn't know it existed. You guys suggested this clip. Yeah. <laughs> and now uh, Paolo is able to check them and make sure that it's a good recording with decent vocal quality or that kind of thing. Uh, I utilize Discord members and, and moderators and patrons a lot. Yes. Um, there's been a couple occasions where if I feel like it's a band that might be questionable, um, I'll grab Claire really quick and just be like, hey, can you watch this? Because yeah. Claire, Claire and I are very similar mindsets. We we both mm -hmm. we're both on the same page in terms of what we're comfortable with with language and visuals and stuff. So mm -hmm. if she tells me it's good, I know that there's nothing I need to worry about. But I mean, there were a, a couple of the new um, Rammstein videos have some questionable parts in them. Oh, I've and, heard about some of those. And I was I was <laughs> I I don't um. I haven't done any reactions to them on my channel, mainly because I've I've been listening to them for 25 years. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's hard to have, for the way that I operate my channel, it, it's hard to have an authentic reaction when it's to something. Like, I can't fake, like, it's like, yeah, guys, this is my first time ever hearing Duhast. <laughs> like, there's no <laughs> way, like, there's no way I could fake that even if I wanted to. Uh -huh. um, so that's one of the reasons I haven't done that. But I, I reacted to two of their new videos live on Twitch. And thankfully, a couple people in the chat were like, hey, at 347 in this video, you might want to black it out on the screen. And I'm like, okay, so I have a stream deck here and I had my finger on the, the hide window view. Oh, cool. And right when I got to that point, I muted it. And in one of the, um, I think in the second to newest Rammstein video, there's a little bit of nudity. And then in the first one, there's visuals of somebody actually giving birth, which wow doesn't bother me. I've, you know, I've, <laughs> like, whatever. I've seen that, <laughs> but, but you, we, you know, with, TOS and stuff like that. It's like, all right, I'm going to play it safe here and uh, not have yes. that on screen. But um, yeah, when it comes, when it comes down to questionable videos, I usually go straight to the Patreon channel on discord and I'm like, Hey, if somebody has time, can I just have you watch this video really quick? Yeah, Don't tell me anything good. about it. Just tell me if it's appropriate for what I put on my channel. So that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. I feel like in our position, we need to have somebody Mm -hmm. that is helping vet those videos otherwise yeah. well otherwise we end up just booting them out part way through recording and we're doing way too much stuff to yeah. be doing that regularly um or uh you get something on the channel that doesn't represent you and yeah uh, yeah there's certain uh, if you ha when you build a channel you have to have standards you have to have a yeah. branding it has to be on brand actually tank when did you when did you put your branding together what branding <laughs> you have brand well you do no, you totally have branding you have like a nice intro and everything like there is very clear branding in your videos. it's actually funny i just started getting rid of that oh well and the reason is is because i've started like when when kirk told me you guys had talked to like mm -hmm. consultant people about stuff i was like yep. i should probably look more into this so i started watching a lot of videos and one of the things i've realized is um the the like the first 30 seconds of a of a youtube video and I realized that like the first 20 seconds of mine was the same thing every single time. Like, you know, hey, what's going on? Blah, 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 roadie reactions. And then I rolled the little intro and then I started getting in and I was like, well, if I just cut that out and just welcomed everybody to the channel and then just went immediately said what we're doing and stuff like that. I'm mm -hmm. I, it, literally, I've only done that with two videos that aren't even released yet. I'm just kind of trying it to see what happens. Interesting. Uh -huh. um, but to be hundred percent honest with you, I don't know anything. I don't know what I'm doing. I just kind of, <laughs> I just kind of do it as I go. Like, 
there are also funny things on my channel that I won't fix because I find them so funny. Like my bio on YouTube says like content creator and streamer, except it doesn't say streamer. It says steamer. <laughs> and that's been there since day one of YouTube because somebody, Amazing. somebody pointed it out and I'm like, I'm never changing that. Cause it's funny. It's really funny. <laughs> um, but my That's graphics, hilarious. my graphics that I use on my channel, Claire actually made. Oh, yeah. awesome. Kudos, so, Claire. Yeah. So like she, but when she was uh, pregnant, she was trying to find something to do at home to keep her entertained and occupied. Mm -hmm. And she started getting into graphic design and she, I got her an iPad and she had one of those, you know, pencils that you can just use on the screen. Mm -hmm. She was just sort of making all these graphics and stuff. So a lot of the, like my top banner and my stuff like that. Yes is from her and then i had a discord member that made a really cool logo recently that um you know this was a cool moment um she made this really awesome logo just for fun it's the i don't know if you've seen it yet because it's new but it's it's a skull with a backwards hat and a beard and stuff and it says tank the tech on it and it's really cool i think um, i did see that wait yeah, did you post that in the discord maybe in the vocal in the vcu oh i, I think i might have yeah, yeah, yeah. okay I, I lurk on there more often than you would. Than you yeah. Do. <laughs> um, but the artist, the artist that made it was just a Discord member that was like, yeah, I just did this for fun. That's cool. And, and everybody was like, you should make merch out of that. I was mm. like, so what I did, because I would feel mega guilty if I took her design and made merch out of it. I did make merch out of it, but I'm splitting that revenue with the artist 50-50. Cause That's I just awesome. thought, I just thought it was such a cool thing. And it's like, yeah, you know, she made the design. I didn't do anything. <laughs> you know? so. Honest chat merch does not tend to make money from no. most YouTubers. No, no people, so, people, people think it does. It's not going to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It can't like, it can be something that can be very helpful for bands or YouTubers, but for most it's really, it's, it's a little something, but I feel that that 50, 50 split with the artist. Um, I just, I just, I just thought it was cool, man. And it's like, yeah. you know, cause I used to work in merchandise for, for a lot of big bands and it's mm -hmm. like, just integrity wise. It's like, I would feel like a, a, a huge asshole if I used this design and didn't, didn't acknowledge or give her anything. I mean, she yeah. spent the time on it, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, there's, there's so many little things. I mean, I learn stuff daily about this, you know, I, our, my viewers joke on Twitch every single stream. We have a pro streamer moment where I just, I don't know how something works or I mute something or <laughs> like, I still, people like you and Kirk and Nick Nocturnal, who is, I, I think people underestimate the intelligence of that guy. He is so ahead of the curve with content in terms of what people want and what they like. And to me, he's he gets lumped into the reactor pool, but I don't really think he is because that's like 20% mm. of his content. Mm -hmm. But the stuff that he does with his guitar playing and stuff and then conversations I've had with him about what he does with YouTube and Twitch and stuff like that, it's like this, this guy knows better than a lot of people what he's doing in terms of marketing on YouTube. Hmm. So I, I learn from people like that. I learn from people like you and Kirk. And as this evolves, you know, things just change little by little each day. And I mean, we'll see. I'm going to be hitting the two year mark next month, Woo! which seems crazy Insane and wonderful. Yeah. Um, so we'll see what happens. I, I really think it's not just, uh, I don't feel like there are just like a few people I, that we learn from on YouTube. I feel like it's, um, very much sharing of information and Kirk and I yes. learned a lot from you as well. Yeah. It's everybody. You can learn, yeah. you can watch any other video and learn something about it. I mean, I, every now and then I, I do watch other reaction videos, not tons, but uh, you know, here and there market research. Yeah. Each, each, <laughs> each one of those videos tells yeah. me, it gives me a little bit of information about what I want to do. Could be as simple as what I don't want to do. It could be watching somebody else's video and seeing them do something and making a mental reminder, be like, yeah, don't do that. Like, you know? I, I, I've done that many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's more likely for me to watch another reactor's video, just random reactors. If I'm mm -hmm. looking at, you know, different things that are coming out and me to find something that I say, oh, I don't think I like that thing. Note to self, don't do that thing on channel. Yeah. 
But uh, I think that having relationships like where we can just talk with you and discuss things that are going on in the background with YouTube, that is, that is incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. It's a hard to know um, how YouTube functions sometimes, especially when it comes to things like copyright, which is the plague of existence for most reaction and analysis channels. It's really hard to know how to navigate that. We have lawyers that help and other artists we'll talk to that can help as well. But specifically in this niche, we have to talk to each other and, and get a better understanding. And then I think that all of us have grown by having having each other as a resource, essentially. I agree. And I, I think that talk behind the scenes is extremely important. Um, I know YouTube, like any other social media or anything in general, it can become kind of a clicky place. Um, mm -hmm. There can be rivalries that develop. There can be friendships that develop. There are, I mean, I can look at the reaction scene and see different groups of people that usually collaborate with each other or talk to each other and stuff like that. And that's totally fine. But I do think it's important that we talk about a lot of this stuff yeah. to really understand how everything works. Because I, um, as, as a roadie, I was always very against talking money with people about anything in life ever. Mm. And an old roadie that I toured with, um, and when I say old, I'm talking, I was like 24 on this tour and he was like 70. And I learned so much from this guy. He was very open about discussing um, like tour salaries and stuff like that. And but what people were mm -hmm. making. And I, I kind of asked him about that one day and I was like, isn't that kind of like taboo? Like you don't talk your pay with other people. He goes, yeah, but think of it this way. He goes, you know how the music industry is and how competitive it is. He goes, if us as workers, like we don't have a union, we don't have representation. If we don't talk to each other and realize what the standard is mm -hmm. and what we're, what people are getting paid and how they're being treated and stuff like that, then that has the potential to just decline. So if we just keep talking to each other about everything, then we know what the standard needs to be for how we need to be taken care of on tours. And I was like, yes. wow, that's a, that's a really fascinating idea. And I've kind yeah. of stuck with that. Like, I don't go around bragging about how much money I made on tour, but if, if there's another person on my crew that's like negotiating a raise or something like that, or is curious, I'll be more likely to talk about it with them just so they know what that standard is. Yep. Uh, yes, exactly. And I actually think that, um, I'll take that even a step further and say, um, uh, growing up for me, talking about finances was just not something that we really did much. Mm -hmm. and I felt that I was not very responsible, like just had almost a, a phobia of doing taxes <laughs> even at one point. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and as an artist, that's like, you just can't manage like that. I got into trouble a few times and um, and really had to work through some things so that I could um, essentially get my taxes all settled out at one point. But I made a very, um, very, I would say, visible <laughs> effort uh, back when I was with LA Opera because a friend had said, if you talk about finances more, you will learn more about how other people are managing them and you will become better at doing it yourself. And I started talking with other opera singers about what they were doing, starting to understand what was happening. And that, I think that was one of the moments when things just shifted for me. And it's also something that as a female, I think many females are not okay talking about finances. So if you start to talk about it a little bit, for me, especially with some other girlfriends, then I feel like that might give them the encouragement when they need to, or when they reach a point where they want to ask for a raise at work. Mm -hmm. We know that it's statistically more likely that they won't ask for the raise. Um, and just by having some more common conversations about it, um, I think it helps them, uh, helps all of us get over those barriers more. <laughs> it is, it is like, there's a fine line of, how do you do this? But mm -hmm. there's also that line of saying, Hey, I want you to be taken care of. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, so. I agree with that. A hundred percent. So it's, it's, it's interesting conversation. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it is, it's, it's hard to do things by yourself. 
That was one of the things I learned on YouTube really quick. It, because it, <laughs> there's, because there's not a lot of, and I don't mean necessarily um, working on our content by ourselves. I mean having that support system around you because there's yeah. not terribly many other people that are doing exactly what we're doing with content. Like even friends right. that I have, like probably look at what I'm doing is like when I when I told the artist I was working for when COVID happened that I was starting a YouTube channel and told like uh, like his management and everybody, what have you guys been up to? I was like, oh, I started a YouTube channel. Dismissive immediately. Yeah. Like they were just like, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. Like, so it's like, there's not a lot of people that really get what we're doing and it can kind of get lonely sometimes. And that's why yeah. I love having people like you and Kirk and Julia and Mark and all these other friends that I've made, like Nick Nocturnal and Orion Reacts and Metal Burb and all them. It's nice to have that support system there of people that understand what we're doing with content. Yes. That you can vent to if you need it. 100%. I think yeah. it's super important. I feel really lucky that um, that we were able to have Kirk on full time with a charismatic voice too because yeah. I actually have somebody at home. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I, I hope for you that, that it gets to that that point too. Maybe yeah. Claire will come on full time as graphic designer. <laughs> That's what I, I've, I've told her that. I was like, we could just turn this into a family business. <laughs> Yeah. Like, but it's, you know, YouTube has allowed me to stay home and mm -hmm. be, I've spent more time with Claire in the last two years than I have in the last 10 because I've, yeah. been, I've been touring all the time. But, you know, this is super, this has been such a super fascinating conversation. And I, I just love talking, you know, to you about <laughs> just really anything. I loved getting more of your background and getting to know you, but I also love the fact that we're also able to talk about some of this YouTube stuff and there yeah. might be some stuff in there that other people that listen just didn't really know about, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. but I know you have a very busy day and you've just started your maternity leave. So I don't want to get into that, but this will be fun though, because I'm probably going to sit on, I'm going to edit this, but I'm probably going to sit on this until you actually do have your kid and release it that week. And then you can come back to this and this will be like a trip in time. You can come back and be like, Hey, I didn't have a kid yet. <laughs> that moment when we were talking about the, the jitters before. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Well, everything will be good. I'll tell you what, you know, it's going through the experience as um, Claire's partner and just being there for her and stuff. I already know Kirk well enough to know that he's a great support system. You're going to be great. Everything will be good. And you know, I hope it's just a, a safe and, and comfortable experience for both of you guys. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see how many bruises he has on his game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they have they have some pretty uh, some pretty wonderful drugs and stuff now. I mean, Claire, Claire got an <laughs> Claire got an epidural, uh -huh. and there were parts there were parts of her labor where it was hard for me as her her partner to watch because they were like doing tests and poking her and prodding her. And she had to keep reminding me, she's like, I don't feel anything just so you know. And I was like, okay, I guess that makes me feel a little better. Oh, about it. Like, all right. So. I've heard that, that, uh, that is definitely very relieving. Yeah. Yeah. So, but man, I can't thank you enough for giving me some of your time today. This was thank fun to you. just sit down and finally just talk to you one-on-one -on -one for a while. Yeah. Um, I'm sure most of the people that are listening are already familiar with who you are, but for those of you that are out there that aren't, you can check out Elizabeth's work on the charismatic voice on YouTube and you're always busy with vocal lessons and all of that stuff. And just, I just thank you for making the time. Cause I know you don't have a lot of it. Well, no, thank you. And I really, I, I like getting to just chat with you and hang yeah. with you. So sure. yeah, Fun. the moment Kirk mentioned that you guys had chat about this, I was like, yeah, of course, duh. Yeah. Like, 100%. Do I want yeah. to sit down and chat with Tank? Yeah. Sweet. For a well, long time. I appreciate it. Well, awesome. thank you again. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Enjoy your maternity leave. And seriously, <laughs> once once that time comes, I hope everything's just comfortable and safe. And can't wait to uh, talk to you when you have a kid and we can compare stories and see how you're doing. <laughs> it's going to be so much fun. Yeah. I did this today. Is that enjoy, normal? Uh, we'll tell you right now the last thing I'm going to leave you with. Okay. Enjoy your sleep now. <laughs> I did not listen to people. I, I, I didn't, I, I was like, I'm a roadie. I've, I'm used to getting four hours of sleep and just going. And they're like, trust me, you're sleep. enjoy your sleep for the next, however long until you have that child with you, because you're, you're going to miss it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Deal. I will get as much sleep as possible. <laughs> 
Awesome. Well, again, have a wonderful rest of your day. And uh, yeah, maybe somewhere down the line, we can just do this again soon and see how awesome. life has progressed for both of us. That, that'd be fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, take care. Thank you again. You too. Well, thank you to all of you guys that are watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify, Apple, Google, and all those other places. And a very huge special thank you to Elizabeth for joining me for this episode. And I think I should probably send out a big thank you to Kirk, her husband as well, for really making this happen, man. I mean, Elizabeth's super busy with so many things, and Kirk was really the one that kind of made this happen and made sure she had time to do this. So... Thanks to the both of them, man. They're wonderful people. I'm so glad I got to sit down with Elizabeth for this one. There's so much cool stuff to unpack from this, man. I mean, not only just her background from education with vocals and her traveling and stuff like that, but even talking to her about the YouTube stuff, man, there were a couple things that it really made me sit and think about things differently after we did this podcast. You know, one of the things that I really, really enjoy about Elizabeth is that her positivity really comes through on everything, man. I mean, there was a couple parts in this one. I'm not going to lie that I, I looked back on and was just like, man, it kind of sounded like a whiny bitch at parts. <laughs> like I was like complaining about, uh, you know, just the YouTube stuff and stuff like that. And Elizabeth's approach on all this and her take was just so cool and so refreshing, man. It really made me rethink a lot of things. And I just can't thank her enough for the time for this, man. And if you're listening to this podcast and you're not familiar with Elizabeth, you can check out a lot of her videos at youtube.com slash the charismatic voice. She has so many different kinds of videos, man. I mean, you know, as we talked, she does the vocal analysis stuff and reactions, but you know, she did that video recently with Will Ramos from Lorna Shore, where they flew out to Utah and did a lot of the vocal science stuff where they shoved a camera down his throat. And I've watched that video, man. And I, it's, it's mind blowing. It's crazy. The fact that they, not only had this idea to do this, but then did it is just so cool, man. So if you haven't seen that video, I would highly, highly recommend going and checking it out, man. Cause it's, it's super cool. And nobody else has really done something like that, that I've seen in this like YouTube reaction scene. So very cool, very groundbreaking stuff, man. So one more time, special, huge, massive thank yous to Elizabeth and Kirk. And thank you to you guys for watching and listening, man. If there's some of you that want to help support this podcast or this channel, there's a few ways that you can do that. Mainly Patreon is a good one. You can check me out at patreon.com slash tank the tech. There's a couple different options to support the content and you at any level that you check out or subscribe to, you get to see all of my YouTube videos early, about two and a half to three days early before everybody else, before it gets posted on YouTube. And there's some other bonuses too. And if you want to get something in return as well, you can check out tankthetechmerch.com. There are some cool designs up there that not only supports me and my content, but the artists that actually did the artwork for the designs too. So those are the two best ways to support the content if you like it, but just know that it's not necessary, man. You guys viewing and listening is enough for me and I appreciate it a ton. I also stream on Twitch from time to time. We do reactions, we do video games. I take reactions at your request on weekends. So if you want to check that out, you can go to twitch.tv slash tank the tech. I'm also on a ton of different social media at tank. The tech is my handle on everything. I'm pretty much on everything, but Facebook, honestly, I got off that a while back and just haven't used it since, but a lot of people keep telling me to get back on at least to make like a, you know, tank the tech page, but we'll see. Maybe it'll come back in the future. But anyways, man, we're at the end of this one. Thank you guys very much again. Be on the lookout for episode 12 because we have another awesome guest that actually came around in like 10 hours. I got the call to do the podcast episode and we made it happen within a 10 hour time frame because this person was getting ready to go on tour and all this other stuff. It's going to be Chris Bose from Ailstorm, man. I was trying to make this happen for a while and it finally did. And it was such a funny conversation. So Chris Bose from Ailstorm and Glory Hammer will be our guest for episode 12. So be on the lookout for that one. But thank you once again. Thank you once again to Elizabeth and Kirk. Wherever you guys are in the world, be safe, be kind to each other. And I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Back Lounge Podcast.